Welcome to the video. So today I'm going to do a video on should you blend things by weight or should you do it by volume? Now this is a question that I get asked time and time and time again and it's a very common question that I found on the internet as well and basically the question is well when I'm blending things can I use just drops in a pipette to blend things or should I be using, say, a beaker to measure out how much of a liquid I'm using, or should I just use a scales? Now, fast forward to the end of this video, the answer is yes, we should always use weights. We should always measure things out. We should always weigh them. We shouldn't use drops and we shouldn't use volume. But I think it's perfectly reasonable if you don't understand why to begin with to want to think, you know, maybe drops are okay, maybe volume's okay, because on the face of it, they seem quite similar. So I'm gonna dive into the reasons that it's actually something that's important and why it's just worth investing in a scale and it's probably the most fundamental piece of equipment that you will need for perfumery. Now that said, back in the old days, they did actually use volumes quite a lot. This book here is The Art of Perfumery and it was written in 1857. And if you look at some of the recipes in there, there are a mixture of weights and volumes and drops and just about everything used in these formulas. This one in particular is all measured in pints, which is a unit of volume. Um, and it goes to show that Back in the, the early days of perfumery, it's kind of anything goes. So if you were to use volumes, it's not the end of the world, right? You can still get somewhere making some perfume. It's just, you might eventually start to run into troubles. So now I'm gonna give you the three main reasons why you wanna use weight instead of volume. Okay, so the first reason is that temperature affects volume. Now, if you look at this graph, which I've got here, this graph is of an ideal gas. So this is kind of a model we use in chemistry to describe things. It's quite a simple model. Um, but what happens to an ideal gas is as you increase the temperature, the volume of the gas increases. Now, when you've got a liquid, especially a real liquid that's not ideal, this graph isn't going to look exactly the same. It's not necessarily gonna be as steep and it's not necessarily gonna be a straight line. But for almost all liquids, when you heat them up, they will expand to some small degree. Now, this is intuitive. This is something that makes sense, right? If you look at this picture here, we've got a certain volume of liquid in a container at a certain temperature. And you've got to imagine that all of the little molecules in the liquid are jiggling around because of all the temperature they have. At a certain kind of amount of jiggling, they're happy sitting there as they are. Now, when we increase the temperature, each one of these molecules has more energy, so it can jiggle more. It's going faster, the velocity is faster, it's got more energy to hit the walls harder. So what this means is the box outside of it is going to have more collisions. So essentially there's a higher pressure exerted on it. Now, if we're at a constant ambient pressure, the net result of that is this liquid is going to expand its box or its container that is in outwards, if it's in a box. Now, the reason this is important is because, well, if we measure by volume, the actual temperature is going to affect how many molecules are in that volume. Now, this could affect you in a lot of situations. For example, if your workspace is outside in a well-ventilated workshop, but it's a bit exposed to the elements, the actual temperature difference for you between, say, winter and summer could be something like 20 or even 30 degrees Celsius. The other thing is, say you're keeping some of your materials in the fridge to keep them fresher for longer, or say you have to heat a thick material or a resin to melt it so you can um, actually weigh it out properly. Well, this means that depending on how hot or cold that material is, you're going to be measuring out a different number of molecules each time. So if you measure by weight instead, because weight is always proportional to the actual number of molecules, then you won't have any of these issues. The second reason for using weight instead of volume is that volume can actually change when you mix two things together. Now, there is a YouTube video which actually shows this in action, so I'll put a link to this in the description, but it's also shown on this plot here. Now, what this plot essentially shows is on the first side, so the left-hand side, you've got pure water, and on the right-hand side, you've got pure ethanol. And the kind of line shows what happens to the volume when you mix these two things together as a proportion. So when you've got pure water, your volume of liquid is the same as the volume of pure water, fine. When you've got pure ethanol, again, the same thing. 
you've got your volume of ethanol is the same as the volume of that ethanol because it is all that ethanol. Now, the interesting thing is what happens when you mix those two things together. Now, you would expect for, say you had a 50-50 mixture, so right in the middle, you would expect the volume to be a half volume of water at a half volume of ethanol. But what it turns out happens is this is not the case. It turns out that the actual volume when you mix these two things together is slightly smaller than the sum of those two individual volumes. Now, the reason for this is that when you mix the two things together, the different kinds of molecules can actually interlock in different ways. And this, when you interlock the molecules together, can actually mean that they find a kind of configuration where they take up less space overall because they're slotting into each other's gaps quite well. Now, this doesn't necessarily always have to make thing, the volume smaller. It could also make the volume bigger. It just depends on the different attractive interactions between the different molecules involved. Anyway, the reason that this is important when you're making a perfume is, well, you're mixing lots of different things together. You're probably mixing between 10, 20, 30 plus ingredients to make your perfume. Now, you have no idea how all of these different molecules are interacting with each other. So, say you make an accord, um, and that's got five different things. You don't know how out of proportion the volume of that accord is to the original ingredients that made up that accord. So essentially, it's very inconsistent. Now, if you were to use weight instead, once again, weight is proportional to the number of molecules. Now, the third and final reason is probably actually the most important reason, um, but it's also potentially a bit harder than the others to illustrate. So the reason essentially is that each liquid has its own unique density. Now, what a density is, is how packed together are the molecules inside the liquid. Now, this is important because when you're doing calculations for different things, so weights and volumes and amounts of things, the density can essentially throw off the volume to make it so that the same volumes of different liquids, because they have different densities, are no longer in proportion to the actual number of molecules in those liquids. Now, okay, so I'm gonna to try to illustrate this with some code. Now, I've basically written some code here, and all it does is effectively creates this table. So we're gonna look at ethanol, which is the solvent we use to make all our perfumes with, and then we're gonna look at beta iron, which is a very common fragrance material, or an aroma chemical. Now the molecular weight of ethanol, so, for a certain amount of ethanol, as in number of molecules, how much does that weigh? And that for that same number of molecules, how much would it weigh if we had beta ionone instead? So the beta ionone is a bigger, heavier molecule, which means for the same number of molecules, you can see that the beta ionone is going to weigh a lot more. It's, um, it's about four times, roughly, the weight. However, the interesting thing here is that the density of the liquids are different. So the density of the beta ionone is above the density of ethanol. Um, so that means essentially the actual weight per unit volume is different. So because there is more weight per unit volume for the beta ionone, uh, so it's a larger number, this means it actually sinks relatively if they weren't to mix, which they do. But if they didn't, or say you put a barrier between them which stopped the mixing, then the beta ionone would actually sink say it was trapped in a ball somehow in a sea of ethanol. Now, from these two, fact, uh, these, two, um, these two quantities, the molecular weight and the density, we can calculate something called the molecular volume. And that is effectively per amount or per a certain number of molecules, what is the volume of that substance? So as you can see, once again, um, the, the molecular volume is larger again for the same amount of molecules for the beta ionone. However, the volume has increased in a proportion dependent on the density. So the relationship between the two molecular volumes is not exactly the same as the relationship between the two molecular weights. Okay, why does this matter? Well, what I've done is now written some code that works out the number of molecules in a given weight of the the uh, stuff say we were weighing it out this is kind of a bit like an experiment you don't really need to understand any of it but effectively what we're doing is okay say we had one gram of beta ionone how many molecules would be in that 
And the answer is, okay, we have roughly three times 10 to the power of 21. So that's a lot, a big number of molecules. It's essentially 3.131, blah, 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 with 21 kind of extra zeros on the end after the, you know, before the decimal place as such. Now, the next two lines say, well, say instead of having a pure one gram of beta ion, what if we wanted to do a one gram where we had a 10% dilution? So let's calculate the number of molecules of 0.1 grams, which is how much we're putting it at 10%, right? 0.1 is 10% of one. So how many molecules are in this 0.1 grams we've added? And then the remaining 0.9 grams, which must be our solvent ethanol, how many molecules are there? Now, this last line is, okay, now if you are to take this number of molecules as a percentage of the molecules in the whole mixture of both of these two together in that so it's a one gram total well what we find is that only 2.59 percent of the molecules are beta ionone and the reason it's only 2.59 is like i was saying above you can see that the beta ionone is about four times um, heavier so you get less molecules in it okay so this sort of calculation here is to say how many more molecules of ethanol would we expect to have over those of beta ionone? So what we find is we should get 3.853 times the number of ethanol molecules to beta ionone to make our solution 10%. So using this 2.59 that we calculated above, if we times that together with the 3.85 that we're expecting, we get our 10% as expected. So all this is effectively showing is that if we measure by weight and we try to use 10% in weight, it ends up that we've actually got 10% in terms of number of molecules. So that's good. So we know that when we measure in weights, we are doing something directly related to the actual number of molecules in our mixture. Now the key difference here is what happens when we repeat all of these calculations and we use volumes instead. So to calculate the number of molecules when we use a volume is a slightly different calculation and it all depends on this molar volume which is that quantity that we had to calculate originally that depended on the density. Now this is the key thing. So the density is affecting this molar volume and that has to be taken into account now for our calculation for the number of molecules. So we repeat the same calculations. So we measure one milliliter of beta ionone, and then we make a 10%, but this time by volume instead of weight solution. And what we find is that's now got 0.1 milliliters of beta ionone and 0.9 milliliters of ethanol solvent. And this is how many molecules are in each of those volumes. Now, when we calculate the actual percentage in terms of molecules to molecules after that, we find that 3.09% of the molecules, having used the volume method, are beta ionon. If we go back up here, it was 2.59. So somehow by using volume, we've actually increased the number of molecules of the thing we're trying to dilute. Now, if we go back and do the second equation above, so we times this by the expected number of molecules that we should have at 10%, we get 11.9. This is the key thing. When we dilute to 10% volume by volume, we actually end up with an 11.9% dilution in terms of weight by weight. But more critically, we end up with an 11.9% dilution in terms of actual number of molecules. So effectively, every time we dilute things, because of these different densities, we're actually getting further and further and further from the truth of what we actually think that our dilutions are. And finally, now we're gonna start talking about droplets. So before I was just telling you why we don't wanna use volume. However, there is something even worse than using volume, which is to weigh by droplets. Now I'm just actually gonna show you this. I'm just gonna weigh some out for you so you can just see firsthand why the droplets are so inaccurate. So I've got some perfume as alcohol here and I've got some beta ionone. So that's the chemical we just had in the previous section. Nice to keep things a bit consistent and just to show you that it's a real perfume chemical that I actually have. But anyway, now when we weigh out the drop of ethanol, it comes to 0.012 grams. 
Now, in my experience, that is about normal for a drop of ethanol. So 0.012 grams. Okay, now let's weigh out the beta iron. So, okay, one drop of beta iron goes in. And that weighs to about 0.017 grams. So that's already quite a bit more than the ethanol. Now, I do notice that it actually went back down on the scale to 0.013. So I don't know if there was a little blow or a gust in the room or something when I was weighing it. When you're weighing to this small of, of an amount, you know, accuracy can become a bit of an issue. So I did it again. I got another drop of beta iron and then I put that on the scale. And lo and behold, this time it was 0.022 grams. Now, even though this scale is plus or minus 0.005 grams, that doesn't account for all of the differences that we've just seen. So I'm now going to tell you why or the different kind of reasons that this can happen. So firstly, there's you pipetting it yourself. When you pipette something, you can always pipette with a different pressure. It's impossible to have exactly the same pressure on the pipette each time. And that pressure with which you pipette actually affects how much comes out in the droplet when it forms. Now, the other thing is the size of pipette itself. So say you had a syringe with a really, really fine orifice versus a quite a large pipette with a large opening, then the amount of liquid that can enter the cavity and form that droplet before it's released is different in each case. Now, the final thing is, of course, the liquid itself. So if you put a liquid with lots of strong interactions, so it likes itself, that means it's going to bind together and it's going to want to form itself into a droplet quickly, which would mean that the droplets aren't going to be smaller. Now, say the liquid doesn't have the same amount of attractive interactions, it means something called its surface tension is lower. That means that it's more likely to what's called wet the pipette or stick to the pipette longer before it releases, allowing more liquid to enter the droplet, making it larger. And yeah, so that's it. I hope you enjoy the video. I hope you learned something from it. And if so, let me know in the comments. If I didn't explain something very well, also let me know and maybe I'll be able to explain it a bit better. And yeah, that's it. So thank you very much for watching the video. Um, have a lovely weekend.